got a kind of Janus thing going on here. Um, light and versus dark. Maybe that's appropriate. We'll see. So today, I didn't have internet most of the day. Um, the, this is uh, May 1st. Uh, it's probably not going to go up to the 3rd, but uh, at midnight, the internet went off. And uh, like an idiot, I didn't have any data on my phone because I let it expire. I knew it, expi it was going to expire a couple days ago. I buy like a, a package the last 30 days, like 11 bucks, 3 gig. Never use it all. So I thought I'd, I'd wait when it expired so that uh, uh, it would go into the next month for various reasons based on my future travel plans. So I thought, I, I hardly ever use it anyway, so I can go a couple days without it. So I woke up this morning uh, with no internet here in the apartment and uh, no data on my phone. Uh, so I had to go get Wi-Fi in a, in a cafe, which was fine. Um, and, uh, you know, I was rather suspicious. At uh, first I was paranoid. I thought I, I used too much data and I got cut off. <coughs> Excuse me, because I did a long video last week on my phone. I don't know how to reduce the bit rate or the whatever you call it on the, the camera. My phone is 5 gig for a half hour video, so I'm not going to be making too many videos on my phone because, you know, it took like four hours to upload. It was ridiculous. So I thought maybe I was in trouble. Then I thought... Well, it's the first of the month, and it went off right at midnight, so I wonder if the landlord didn't pay the bill. So when I finally got in touch with them today, I was like, oh, sorry, it'll be on in a couple hours. So, I mean, that's pretty much an admission. He forgot to pay the bill. But it's no big deal. It's back on now. But I had I wanted to watch a lot of uh, videos today. I was kind of set aside today for just watching people's videos and commenting. That didn't get done. And... Uh, That was kind of a bummer. And now it's late and it's back on. So I thought I'd make a video. I could have made a video anyway during the day doing something else, but I was, you know, kind of aggravated. So what I did instead is I spent a lot of time listening on, uh, what's it called? I, I uh, have this, this is what I listened to today. The Saga of the Volsungs. Translated and introduced by Jackson Crawford, along with, can't really see there, along with the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. I think this is a version that a lot of people are reading. This I'm, I did this for Sagalong 2024. It's very short. The audiobook book version of, I think if I, you just listened to the Volsung saga itself and, and not all the extra material, it's probably only like two and a half hours. It was terrific. Um... So it was a good thing to do today. I did it all backwards. I listened to the 45-minute introduction the other day just to see, just to set it up. And then I listened to the, the second one, the, oh, the, the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok first, even though it's kind of a sequel. I mean, it's by a different author. You can really tell it's by a different author, too, which I thought was interesting. Um, this is a pretty new uh, translation from what I understand. I think a few other people who are all, all obviously link, linked to the go hosting the event. I'm thinking maybe uh, oh, I'm not really sure who it was. I think one of the people doing it, who's not on the coast, but one of the people said on their channel they were going to do it, is also listening to this same audiobook version. Probably every one of these co-hosts certainly is smarter than me, and probably everyone else who's reading the Sagalons who's going to do a video on it is smarter on me about this subject anyway. Don't need to be overly modest. But I don't really know anything about the, the Icelandic sagas other than what I've watched on the other host's short videos and, um, and the introduction here. This version was also read by Jackson Crawford. I don't know why. I don't know why. He's an okay reader. It's, it's not terrible, but I'm, somebody else could have read it better, I think. I guess it's interesting to have the translator 
read his own introduction, certainly. And, you know, I'm, I think they could have found somebody better. You know what? Right now, I can't show you, but up on my up on my window behind my camera, I've got my YouTube page. And I see that Jackson Crawford has a channel. Uh, Jackson Crawford, this translator, has a channel. And I guess I should link to this. Saga of the Volsungs, part one, six years ago, 35,000 views. Uh, looks like he's... Uh, um, a doctor at University of Colorado is, is where he's based, or he was six years ago. So those are the things to read about these great sagas. I really enjoyed it. I had recently finished um, reading a fantasy novel by Paul Anderson called The Broken Sword. That was recommended. I, that was all. Awesome. Oh. All right. Man, I wish I could edit. Okay, um, but I can't, so. Uh, da, da, da. Paul Anderson. So that was recommended by Michael K. Vaughn. It was also recommended, and that was also audiobook that I read, uh, that I listened to. Because The Broken Sword was a novel that was known to me for many years because as Michael K. Vaughn, and I'll try to remember to link to that particular, I, know, I probably can't find it because he probably talked about five or six things in there. Uh, but it was also a favorite, that Broken Sword is a favorite of Michael Moorcox, one of my favorite fantasy writers, who called it better than Lord of the Rings. And I'd go along with that because I'm not the bi world's biggest uh, Lord of the Rings fan. Also, to be honest, I wasn't the biggest Paul Anderson fan either. In fact, when I, I tried to read a lot of his, his books when I was a kid, I read Brainwave. I managed to finish that, which is kind of the Paul Anderson book that used to appear on all the, like, the David Pringle 100 uh, best uh, science fiction books. It was a book that was published that had reviews. It was just c considered like a staple. Paul Anderson also wrote many other science fiction books, a few fantasy books, but a lot of, I think, like a time patrol or some kind of thing. I could just never get into them, but... I certainly felt different now. Maybe I was just trying to read it. Maybe he was over my head. He is kind of a, he's kind of a, not in a bad way, but a wordy writer or a cerebral writer. And um, having read The Broken Sword first, then reading uh, the, the saga of the Volsungs, I see where uh, Paul Anderson was obviously uh, very influenced by, if not this specific saga, although he might have been, then the uh, the Edda's, uh, the Poetic Edda, or the uh, the other one, the Prosaic Edda, I guess. Um, and, you know, it's clear because both The Broken Sword, the Anderson novel, which is, I think it was written in the f 50s, um, 1950s, and the Volsung saga, you know, and start very far back before, you know, in the ancestry of who will end up being the major character uh, of the of the particular work. So I'm, I'm rambling and vamping because I really don't have anything to say because I'm not qualified to talk about these, but I did enjoy them. I've read, in the past, I'd read the Nibelungate, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, also this, you know, under the version of the of the story of Siegfried and, Ger and, and Gertrude, is that her name? Because I had seen the Fritz Lang horror, uh, the Fritz Lang silent films, the two, uh, the two film series that he did in like 1920 or something, Fritz Lang, director of Metropolis, Siegfried, and I forget what the second one is called. Uh, which are very powerful movies. I saw them when I lived, I guess I lived in San Francisco, and they were probably either at the, one of the big movie palaces, like the Castor or something there. They would occasionally show uh, silent films. One great thing about living in a big uh, American city with a movie palace, and they have one in Seattle too, called the Paramount, and I'm sure LA has them, and, and New York has them, is these opportunities to see these fantastic silent films on the big screen, which is really the way to watch them because it's hard to sit down 
with a 21st century mindset and uh, five screens around you all the time and actually sit down and concentrate on a silent film the way you would when they're made but they're they're so well made the best silent films are just so fantastic i mean obviously if you haven't watched any watch a a comedy one first like watch the general by buster keaton or sherlock jr is pretty short with any buster keaton film but the dramas are also excellent and you know there's some there's some uh conventions you know you got to get used to the the level of acting the you know kind of you know something like obviously like the cabinet of dr caligari or something <coughs> you get you know obviously painted sets very stylized kind of filmmaking and and but Fritz Lang was uh, was very realistic or tried to be realistic in his filmmaking and you know it's the same so the Nibelung cycle is the same same material that's used by Wagner for the Ring cycle and which I don't know anything about except that it was written and those are German operas so I don't know any other than that I don't really know anything about sagas or how they work or I mean, I've read a few older things like Beowulf and which is similar but probably older. The Saga of the Volsangs, I believe, is from the 13th century. So pretty modern as as, as these go. Um, what was I going to say about it? And, you know, of course, there's, so there's not psychological realism or anything in these. You, you just have to read them for, for with their own rhythm, like the like the Green Knights, like this too. You know, they're kind of halfway between history and storytelling and fairy tale and um, and um, adventure and and so I can see why so many people are inspired by them, especially in the middle of the 20th century, to start writing you know realistic novels based on this because there's so much material to mine. You know, there's so much you can do with because they'll, they'll, the saga writers will, will tell a story in just a few lines that you can really, you know, delve into and kind of, you know, sit back and think about or explore after you listen to it. Because, like I say, they're not very long. I don't know how many generations the Volsung saga goes through, several. And the, the, you know, I wrote down her name, but I forgot already. But anyway, the second one in this book, oh boy, she just left him on because I can't read. Rag, the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok starts, you know, kind of picks up, I think that's why I put them together. It picks up with right after the death of the main characters who die very abruptly at the end of the, the saga of those songs. It's like, well, that's the end of the saga, they're dead. You know, and the daughter is, uh, so the stepfather of the daughter is trying to hide her out. And one thing you can tell that they're diff by different writers, uh, I think, I could be wrong, but I think there's humor in the uh, saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. I could be wrong. There's definitely scenes with... Uh, non what do you call them how do i what do i say in a sensitive way non-heroic characters uh working peasants i guess because there's these people the the opening section of this of this latter saga has to do with um the stepfather of, of this girl who's the last surviving daughter of the, the volsungs um he hides her in a harp you know that's the kind of thing it's in these, like, how do you hide a person in a harp? Like, a harp, is it is a harp shaped the, what I'm thinking of a harp? Or is it more like a guitar where it has, you know, like a harpsichord? Harpsichord. Or is it like, like where there's, like, in, internal panel stuff? Anyway, he, he hides the child in there. He he goes to these, these people and asks them to put him up for the night. This woman is very nice to him and says, you know, why don't you sleep outside? because me and my husband talk really loud when he gets home. And he's like, uh, it's up to you. It's for you to decide where I'm going to sleep. 
And so she does, then, then she concocts this plan. Her husband come ho comes home. And she says, you know, I got a great idea. You're such a terrible provider. Why don't, we, why don't you kill this guy? I'm sure he's rich. I can just tell by the way he acts and behaves. And we'll, we'll kill him. Then we'll have money, finally. And he's like, I'm not doing that. And she's like, well, okay, fine. Because he said he wants to marry me. And if he doesn't, and so if you don't do it, I'm just going to run off with him. And he goes, all right, fine, I'll, I'll kill him. And he, and he hits him, and he runs away. He's not very brave, and, and, but uh, this guy actually does realize he's going to die from the blow, so he dies, and they, they break open the harp. <clears throat> they find the girl in there. Now, in psychologically realistic fiction, they would have no problem killing the girl. There's plenty of people killing children in in these sagas. It's not something that they have a that they have that there's a huge taboo against. But they're like, uh, see, we're being punished now because now we have to raise this girl because we did a terrible thing, which was kill this person who we offered shelter to. He was our guest. We murdered him for his money, for his little bit of money. Now we're gonna have to raise the girl. That's our punishment. And that's what the, the wife says, even though it was her idea. And the husband says, no, we can't do that. Everybody's going to see this beautiful girl and know that we, like, you're so ugly and I'm so ugly. And this is the actual dialogue and the thing. No one's going to believe this kid is ours because she's like a golden goddess. Because, you know, there's a very big, you know, all through these sagas, like the royals are beautiful, you know, and handsome. And, and, and they have great hair and, and, and all that. And the other people are just like little troll people because they're lower class. But um, what I want to say about that is like it's, it's really funny dialogue just because of the way they're so, there's no subtext, you know, what they're saying to each other. Like, we're really ugly. He's like, and the, and the, the woman's like, don't worry, I'll cut all her hair off and I'll cover her head with tar so it doesn't grow back. And then, and then we'll, we'll dress her in really filthy clothes and no one will know she's not our our daughter and if, if they do say she looks too pretty to be your daughter I'll just tell them look you don't know I was very beautiful when I was young and that's what I look like so there so now it could just be me just finding this funny because of uh, different, you know the modern sensibility but I kind of think there might have been a really intention, intentional to make this humorous the way like Shakespeare or many other writers made the working class characters the lower class characters more humorous I mean it's terrible what they do and everything but it was a long time ago. So the reason I'm talking about these kind of observations is I don't have anything profound to say. Uh, I did want to cover it because I did notice, uh, you know, kind of dovetailed with the broken sword that I, I just read. You know, there is also a broken sword in that, that figures in the, the family saga of the Volsungs. It's about this family named after a particular king, and they refer to the whole family as the Volsungs, but... Most of their names are like Sigurd and Siggy and Sigmund and things like that. And some wild stuff in it. It's it's really good, but, you know, there's really... Uh, what time are we at? There was, there was a guy... You know, there's a lot of tests of manhood and things like that. And there's a lot of goading of people of manhood. And there's things like... In the saga of the Volsungs, there's a scene where this guy, this woman, sends her son to to the to the king or whoever it was, and you know, they go they go through the people so fast. I pro it, probably not the best way to read it was probably not on audio because they go through the the, the generations so fast, and many of the names are kind of similar. <clears throat> but it sends them to this guy and. The, gives this, this young boy uh, the task of making bread. And he's I'm going to go out hunting. You make this bread. There's a sack of flour. Make bread. And he comes back, and the kid didn't make the bread. And he's like, well, why didn't you make the bread? And he's like, there's something moving in that f flour sack. I didn't want to go near it. There's something in there, something alive. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. Well, obviously, I don't want you on my... I don't want you in a fight with me if you're scared of an animal trapped in a sack. And he tells this to the mother of the child, and he's like, yeah, really? Well, 
Well, he doesn't need to live anymore. I believe that's the actual phrase that she said in this translation. He, he doesn't need to live anymore. So kill, kills that kid for being a wuss. <laughs> next, the, ne- the next section is like, and then the next year they she sent another son and the same thing happened. He was also a wuss. Then later she, fi- then, uh, you know, eventually another kid comes. You know, there's some other stuff happens. Then there's another kid who comes and he makes the bread. And the hero comes back from hunting and goes, so what about that bread? And he's like, oh, yeah, I made it. He was like, well, do you have any problems or anything? And he's like, well, there's something moving around in there. So I just beat the hell, yeah, you know, I pounded the hell out of it and ground it all up. And and he's like, oh, that's okay. Well, but don't eat it because that was a poison snake. So you better not eat that bread. But he, the hero, can eat it because they, they, he's a... Uh, actually immune to the poison but he's nice enough to tell the kid not to eat the bread because the poison would kill him um so it's very very enjoyable to read the story and just to see uh the background of it and just um it was all new to me and so i'm glad i read it uh, uh what else the broken the Broken Sword, to go back to Paul Anderson a bit, there's a whole bunch of different covers. It's been around for a long time. I'll make a thumbnail of these. Uh, now it makes me want to read some more Paul Anderson. Um, I didn't look it up before this, but I wonder if there's some information on exactly what Sagas directly inspired Paul Anderson to write that. You can tell by his name, P.O. UL and then last name Anderson, he's a uh, Scandinavian extraction, I believe. I think he's like 6'5 or something. Really tall guy. Interesting guy, very well liked in the science fiction community back then when he was alive. And I want to read more stuff by him and I want to read more sagas. So I appreciate the, the host who created this. Uh, Revenant Reeves, Book Time with Elvis, Sean D. Steadfast, St. Donahue. Tilly, Tilly a Shelf, Rambling, Raconteur, 1616. The usual suspects who always come up with some of the best events that I've encountered. So I was glad I was able to fit this in because I'm going to go hard on horror for the rest of the month. I think probably by the time this goes up, I'll have done at least one horror post or two. And I've got so much stuff to read. So I'll leave it there and I'll get back to reading. Hope you're reading something fun. Let me know if you are interested in the sagas or not.